Honorable Justice Uday Umesh Lalit, Chief Justice of India designate, my brother and sister judges of the Supreme Court of India, Sri Tushar Mehta, Solicitor General of India, Sri Vikas Singh, President and Office Bearers and the members of the Supreme Court Bar Association, Sri Pradeep Kumar Rai, Vice President, Sri Manoj Kumar Misra, President and Office Bearers of the members of the Supreme Court Advocate on Records Association, law officers, senior advocates, and members of the bar, other distinguished guests, media persons, and ladies and gentlemen. I am searching for words to adequately express my gratitude for the good words spoken about me by all. I am very happy to see judges, senior advocates, advocates, members of the bar, people from legal fraternity, all my well-wishers, family friends, family members who have come here taking trouble to reach this place and bid farewell to me. I thank each and every one of you for assembling here and for showering your blessings on me and my family. You all know where I started. My life's journey began in a remote village called Ponnavaram in Krishna district of Andhra Pradesh, where electricity, roads, and basic amenities were not available. First time I saw electricity when I was 12 years old. I learned the alphabets of English around the same time. We used to reach school by walking on muddy roads across the fields and crossing the streams. With a lot of struggle and hard work, I have come up in life. For this, I thank first my gurus, that is my parents and the teachers in various government schools. I am indebted to all my teachers, lecturers, because the essence of education that they had given to me was helpful not only for the purpose of acquiring academic knowledge, but also helped in providing necessary moral strength and courage to face any calamity in life. This arduous journey finally brought me to Delhi. This long journey marked by many experiences, most of which are sour rather than sweet. As the young age of 17 years, I could lead a trade union around 10,000 workers. At the same time, I could also lead students, farmers, and employees. I was immersed in so many agitations and struggles. I have also suffered on account of the emergency excesses. In fact, I lost an academic year in this count. Confronting problems and resolving issues is not something new to me. This period enabled me to interact with persons of various ideologies and broadened my horizons. They taught me as how to live in isolation in an environment where you cannot express or share your thoughts of, on any of these issues. I witnessed the resilience of human existence, the power of human struggles, dignity and poverty, and most importantly, unshakable hope and faith. Through these ordinary everyday experiences, I developed the extraordinary fashion of serving the people. Being a first generation lawyer, I have faced many challenges in my life and realized that except the hard work, there is no shortcut to success. The journey of struggle and Mr. And bitter experiences in my career helped me to diversify my activities. I had the opportunity of defending the state in several cases. I watched the important events of this country unfolding from close quarters. I always accepted rejection as God's reduction and retained my honesty and integrity. I want to 
every advocate to remember that sometimes life scares you and beats up you, but there is a day when you realize that you are not just a survivor, you are a warrior. <laughs> you are tougher than anything that is thrown you away. My professional life was also full of challenges. To begin with, I was in two minds, to be a judge or to become the people to offer leadership. I believe in destiny, in God, and the blessings of the Almighty. It has been the honor of my life to be elevated as a judge. I accepted it with full all humility. I always remembered myself while functioning as a judge on my privileged obligation to discharge services to this great society. Once I became a judge, I gave my heart and mind to it. From the date I joined bench, I reached the highest possible position in the judiciary. I have subjected to conspiratorial scrutinies. My family and I suffered in silence. But ultimately, the truth will always prevail. Satyamaya Vajayate. At this juncture, I am reminded the words of Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in the moment of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenges and controversies." Unquote. Anything and everything that I could achieve were only after facing a lot of struggle, setbacks, and hardships in life. I have embraced all the challenges that came my way and strengthened myself and understood that every failure carried with a seed of equivalent advantage. I never claimed myself to be a scholarly judge or a great judge, but I have always believed that the ultimate purpose of justice delivery system is to provide justice to the common man. I have elaborated in my career earlier speeches as how difficult the life of a judge is. Your health also gets ruined in the process. Only judges and lawyers understand this aspect of judges' life. It is for you people, lawyers particularly, to explain to the people of hard work involved in a judge's life. Now coming back to the jurisprudence. In the last 75 years of our jurisprudence have evolved considerably. Our judiciary is not defined by a single order or decision. Yes, at times, it felt sort of people's expectations, but most of times, it has championed the cause of the people. It is widely predicted that the A.K. Gopalan case, the due process of law was history. But this court in case of Mahanaka Gandhi restored what was taken away earlier. Similarly, A.D.M. Jabalpur was seen as a death canal on personal liberty. Subsequently, the error was stood rectified by nine judges bench in K. S. Swami. The institution never hesitated to remedy itself. Your hope upon the institution cannot be so weak that it is, that it is shattered with one perceived unfair judgment. When it comes to an individual judge, the expectations are very high. In the game of cricket, the player is expected to hit every ball for a six. After all, everyone loves to hit six but, and win a close off for himself and the team. But only a player knows as how to deal with each ball given the conditions of the pitch, the style of bowling, and the placement of the fielders. At times, the circumstances may not allow him to score even a single run. The advocates are best placed to understand this predicament of a judge and dispel wrong notions about them. Here I would like to read out the senior advocate, Mr. Sanjay Hirde, wrote in a newspaper article, I quote, this is in the context where I have decided a case of Anuradha Basin, where right to speech right access to internet, etc. There is a criticism that I have not given full relief. I quote that article. 
when a senior advocate asked Justice Bhagavati about the dichotomy between the reasoning and the relief, that is in Menaka Gandhi and R.D. Setti, the judge explained that his brother judges were only concerned with the relief being denied in those cases. As long as Justice Bhagavati followed their lead on the relief, he got to write the judgment and lay down doctrine of law that continue to operate deep into the future. Every lawyer who today wins on the basis of R.D. Setti and Menaka Gandhi judgments owes his victories in no small measure to Bhagavati's foresight." Unquote. In earlier days, the bar used to play a proactive role in the resistance. The members of the bar used to willingly associate themselves with various social causes. It is the legal battles initiated by bar association that have led to progressive interpretation of the constitution. It is in this spirit that bar must work to strengthen democracy. One aspect that I want to bring to your notice is my choice of traveling across the country almost every weekend to speak to the public through various events. The popular perception is that the Indian judiciary was alien and quite distant to the general public. There are also still millions of suppressed people who need judicial help, who are apprehensive to approach the judiciary in times of need. My experience so far has convinced that in spite of fulfilling its constitutional mandate, the judiciary does not find adequate reflections in the media, thereby depriving the people of knowledge about the courts and the constitution. I felt it was my constitutional duty to dispel these notions and bring the court closer to the people by way of generating awareness and building confidence among the people about the judiciary. From what I get to hear from the common people during my visits, I am happy to note that people are able to engage with me on my subject in their language. I have actively tried to promote a sense of, say a sense of belongingness of the people with the system. My constant endeavor was to make the people aware, not just about their rights and obligations, but also about the constitutional scheme and democratic values and the institutions. My sincere efforts was to initiate a dialogue. As a part of my public speaking engagements, I have focused on certain subjects of institutional importance. The focal point of any justice delivery system is the litigant, the justice seeker. But our system, practice, rules being colonial in regime may not be best suited to the needs of Indian population. The need of the hour is the Indianization of our legal system. When I say Indianization, I mean the need to adapt to the practical realities of our society and localize our judicial delivery system. I have pushed for modernization of judicial infrastructure as a means of providing access to justice. I also try to highlight the difference between the arrears and backlogs to put things in perspective. Arrears refer to delays that are unwanted, unwarranted. Every delay is not an arrear. Some cases of delay might due to valid reasons. On the other hand, backlogs refers to a situation where the number of cases instituted in a period is more than the number of cases disposed of in the same period. I am happy to inform you and thank my colleague judges and collegium judges, Brother Justice Lalit, Justice Kanvilkar, Justice Dhanunjay Chandrachur, Justice Nageshwara, and consulting judges. In the last 16 months, we could appoint 11 judges to the apex court and 255 recommendations for various high courts, now already 224 as appointed. And this amounts to nearly 20% of the total sanction strength of the High Court. Due to our concerted efforts, we could make considerable progress in appointing more number of women judges and promoting social diversity on benches. We got 15 new chief judges of various High Courts during the same period. This process is a reflection of the coherence and determination of the judges to strengthen our institution to further the goal of justice. These are the issues that I tried to do my best to solve. However, I acknowledge there are many other issues 
that the system is facing and it needs scientific assessment. From the very beginning, my stand is that since independence, no systematic assessment of the judicial system in, the, in India has taken place. The bar, the bench, and the government are all equal stakeholders in the justice delivery mechanism. We need their coordination efforts to revamp the entire system. The issues faced by the judiciary cannot be looked into isolation. The judiciary is an independent when it comes to adjudication of cases, but with respect to finances or appointment, it is still dependent on the government. To coordinate and to get the cooperation from the government, the interaction is inevitable, but interaction does not mean influence. I hope this dialogue between the judiciary and the public will continue. I am demoting my office with utmost contentment. When you ultimately judge me as a judge, I would like to say that I may be judged as a very ordinary judge, but one who greatly relished and enjoyed the job. I may be judged as one who meticulously followed the rules of the game and did not trespass into provinces problem. More particularly, as one who recognized preliminary the moral power of a judge. I may be remembered as a judge who heard the senior and junior alike. <laughs> as a judge, I always wanted my name to be itched on the hearts of the people through my conduct and behavior, rather than case law and generals. <laughs> I want to remain in those vibrant hearts which will give me warmth and keep me going forever. I have seen, I have been seen the flow of emotions in courtroom number one this morning. This is a reflection of the strong sense of your belongingness with the institution. I was touched by the display of emotions, in particular by Attorney General Sibyl, Mr. Dave, and Solicitor General. With my best intentions and efforts, I have carried out my solemn duty with a debt of gratitude to my motherland. This country has provided me with many opportunities and happiness, and it was an honor to serve you all. Both your support and criticism has carried me this far. The end of my tenure just marks the end of my constitutional assignment. However, I shall fulfill the constitutional woes till the end of my last breath. I did my best, whatever I can. It is with the cooperation of all my brother and sister judges. Credit goes to everyone. I never miss an opportunity to quote the famous Telugu poet Mahakavi Gurujada. Deshe mante matti kadoi, deshe mante manushloi. Gurujada gave a universal definition to the concept of nation. He said, a nation is not merely a territory. A nation is essentially its people. Only when people it, it's when when we it, when people its progress, the nation progress. Swantalabam kanta manukoni paruguvari ke thod padavai. Gurujada went on to urge people to raise above one's own interest and to extend a helping hand to those in need. If we put this principle in practice, we will soon start seeing a better world, free of conflicts and violence. It is towards establishing such a progressive world that we collectively need to endeavor as a global citizens. And enlightened citizens and as the most important stakeholders of our judicial system, I urge upon you all to think about the society, the nation, that is the people. It is the universal brotherhood that will bridge the gap. Before I conclude, I would like to place on record my sincere thanks to all my colleagues on the bench. I congratulate first my brother, Justice Lalit, Chief Justice of India designate, who is going to take over tomorrow. <laughs> I am confident that his tenure will be a grand success. I request all of you to extend fullest support and cooperation to my brother, Justice Lalit. He has already proved his leadership while he is the chairperson of NALSA. 
I had no doubt that his focus and priority will definitely take care of the institution. I had the privilege of being guided by the learned Attorney General Sri K.K. Venugopal, the Bhishma Patamaha of the Indian Legal Fraternity. I also thank the Solicitor General of Sri Tushar Mehta for his active assistance to the court. On a personal level, he is a good human being. He comes forward readily to help anyone in need. I want to correct here Mr. Tushar Mehta, just like the IB reports, this is your report that I am going to write in romantic novel is not correct. I may, I may write some books on literature, I may write some books about the historical events which has taken place while I was in as an advocate and all that. Mr. Vikas Singh, I need not tell, he's a strong leader, the president of the SCBA, a dynamic man. He's a very <laughs> persuasive. But only one caveat I want to advise Vikas is, Vikas ji, with little soberness, he can achieve many more. I would like to sincerely thank the Secretary Generals, the registrars of the entire registry of the Supreme Court. My personal residential staff has worked with me for a long time. I thank them all for their constant dedication and hard work. The media has been extremely cooperative in disseminating the information about the judiciary. You share the equal burden of dispelling myths and notions. I thank you for being an active partner in this collaborative project of strengthening the judiciary. I thank each one of the journalists who have been covering the proceedings of the Supreme Court diligently, efficiently, and instantly. My journey so far has been made possible due to innumerable sacrifices made by my reward parents, Ganapati Rao and Sarojini Devi. And my two elder sisters, Prabhanjani and Vani. My wife, Sivamala, stood me like a rock through thick and thin. She has been my equal partner in all my struggles and successes. I am blessed with two loving daughters, Dr. Sri Bhuvana and Sri Tanuja, who continue to cheer my life. Now, my family also includes Ritesh and Trilok, my son-in-laws, and with three grandchildren, Sriya and Sri Nitya and Sri Virat. I do not have to worry about my post-retirmental phase. They will take care of me. <laughs> With these words, I must thank one of all of you, my friends, my childhood friends, and my relatives, some judges, lawyers, came across all the way from remote places from Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and all that. I thank each and every one of them. Before concluding, I want to say, because you must have seen, I am correcting my draft on the table also. Because after going back tomorrow, today morning uh, court, I started dictating this uh, note. Uh, so I could not properly place the, some of these things. It's my favorite quote, but I want to tell you. This is a English politician said it, I quote, History is not the burden of one man or woman alone, but some are called upon to meet a special share of its challenges. History is more than the path left by the past. It influences the present and can shape the future, unquote. Only history can judge as to the influence of the path left by me on the present and the future. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, sir.